It's always good to be at a conference like this and reassure myself that my Facebook friends actually exist in real life, so I'm glad to see many of you. And uh, I would, uh, what I'm going to do, let me just uh, explain the, the scope of my talk. So I am uh, an economist for, coming from the tradition of what's called the Austrian School of Economics. And what I'm going to do, okay. Can we get a clap for liberty? No. Now I won the crowd over. Okay. Uh, what I want to talk about, as, as I was trying to figure out what could I give to this group that maybe another speaker wouldn't, wouldn't be giving you, because obviously there's a lot of people here who know more about uh, the mechanics of Bitcoin than I do, and I'm coming at this as, a, as an economist who was a former college professor and so forth. So I think what I can do with this group uh, is I want to make sure you understand why it is, because I'm sure many of you have, have noticed this, that there's a, a bit of a pushback from some in the Austro-Libertarian community where you more normally would probably expect that they would be huge proponents of Bitcoin and all currencies more generally, and yet there's this vehement uh, hostility to it coming from certain quarters, and in particular citing what's called uh, Ludwig von Mises' regression theorem. Okay, So my goal in this talk is to... Uh, very quickly just distill down the, the elements of Austrian economics and in particular its treatment of monetary theory that you would need to know so that you at least understand where they're coming from, right? Because I think there's, there's two things going on in terms of that hostility. One is just human nature that you got a thousand different things libertarians are trying to sort of beat back the state. And so if, if Bitcoin ends up working or, you know, the things in this genre start working, and other people were naysaying in the beginning, well, then they feel silly, and so that sort of reinforces this. There's nothing you can do about that if it's just that the horse that they put their money on, they're always going to be bitter about it. But it's more than just that. There really is a reason, and what you'll see it once I explain it to you, why it is that people coming out of the Austrian tradition of economics and the way Austrians explain monetary theory, why Bitcoin just came out of left field. And it, it took... It, it takes someone from that background a while to just get their head wrapped around what Bitcoin even is and how it could be possible. And so that's what I want you to see. So especially because I know there's a lot of you in here who are sort of like Bitcoin evangelists. And I want you to understand so you can at least, you know, know how to approach these people and try to argue with them and see where they're coming from. OK, so to do that, I'm going to need to explain th three pieces, two things that Carl Menger contributed to economics and then one thing that came from Mises. And then when I give you those three things, you'll be in a position to really, you know, like I say, it'll be obvious to you why there's this uh, hostility from certain quarters against Bitcoin. All right, so Carl Menger is the founder of what's called the Austrian School of Economics. In case you don't know that phrase, it's not that they study the GDP in Vienna. The reason it's called Austrian Economics is just that historically, that's where these people happen to be from. It was actually a term of derision that the German historical school economists we're just dismissing these guys in the 1870s and saying, oh, that's just Austrian economics because Germany was the, the center there and these guys in Austria were, it was just a backwater. So that's where the name came from and it stuck. Um, so Karl Menger in the, in the early 1870s wrote a book that we now translate as The Principles of Economics and that was the foundation of what we now call the Austrian school. So Karl Menger did all sorts of things. Two things that we need to know for what I'm trying to get across tonight is his explanation for the origin of money and then also what's called subjective value theory. All right, so the origin of money, uh, and this is not just that Austrians go to Karl Menger. He actually crystallized the way professional economists in the late 1800s dealt with the origin of money. He actually wrote the encyclopedia entry for the relevant uh, periodical on this topic. Okay, So he was the authority. It's not just that today's Austrians look back to him because he's their guy. He was, everyone thought he was the guy for this topic. So the first uh, thing that Menger does is he explodes what might be called the state theory of money. So that there was a prevailing view, just like we see today, where people kind of just assume that if something useful socially exists, it must have been consciously created by somebody or some group, and probably that they were had political authority. And that, that's and you see that you know that pattern today. Whenever there's an issue, you know the the catchphrase, oh, there ought to be a law. Right, or whenever there's some kind of social problem, a lot of people, the knee-jerk reaction is, well, the government ought to do X, Y, and Z to deal with that. Well, that also was true among professional economists uh, in certain sects that they thought, well, clearly money is useful, and so therefore some wise king or something in the past must have invented it. 
And so Menger just walked through and critiqued and said, well, no, that doesn't really make sense. For one thing, we don't have a record of that. Right? It's not that there was some guy, you know, maybe called Eddie Money, who invented this thing, and then we now that's that's his legacy. You you would think, you know, we have all kinds of things about Hammurabi, you know, giving law and so forth, and, and things that these rulers did. You'd think the guy who invented money, we might remember him, and, and there is no such record. All right, so he's saying that's one strike against it. So the other thing is, if you hadn't grown up in a society using money, it's kind of a crazy idea, right? Imagine if you grew up in a society where people were just bartering. And then somebody comes along and says, hey, instead of trading for stuff that you actually want, why don't you trade away your valuable stuff for something you really don't want to use at all? But as long as we can all agree to do that, then it'll be fine because you'll, you'll get something else. You know, like, let's grab this shell. Nobody likes these shells for anything, but give me your cow for this shell. And don't worry because whatever you actually want to get, you can just, that person will take the shell as well. Right? That, that sounds crazy, that, that idea. If you've never experienced money firsthand, it sounds like a nutty idea. Even though now, in, in hindsight, we realize that using money is actually very productive. Uh, another problem that Menger pointed out was to say, even if some wise king or some you know uh, smart intellectual sage came up, dreamt up the idea of of using money when they had no firsthand experience with it, how would you know what its purchasing power should be? So even if you could get everyone to agree, oh yeah, it would be better if instead of us trading things directly for what we want. We all agree to sell our stuff for these shells, let's say, and then we'll go use the shells to buy whatever it is that we need. So there'll be like a, a middle step in the transaction. Uh, even if we could all agree that that's a sensible way to proceed, how would you know how much stuff a given shell could buy? What its purchasing power would be? That that also would be completely arbitrary. And so that not only would the king have to sell everybody on the idea of using money, he would also have to lay down what the exchange ratios were, like how many shells for a horse, how many shells for a cow, and so forth, right? So Menger was just walking through and trying to get to see the, the enormity of the problem that it's, it's not obvious how could you go from a state of not using money to a position of using money without assuming some superhuman intellect along the way and then a lot of force backing it up. So what Menger then gave, so that seems like, a, well, gee, okay, you, you, you knocked it down, but then what's the solution? He almost makes it look like it's an impossible problem. And what Menger gave... And he didn't invent it out of whole cloth. You can see versions of this even in Adam Smith, but Menger kind of crystallized it and explained it really logically, is he gave a step-by-step -step account of how people starting in barter could end up using money even though at no point was that anybody's intention, that nobody consciously said, let's try to move society so that 10 years from now we're all using money, that no one had any goal like that in mind. They were just doing what was in their immediate self-interest and yet the spontaneous product of those efforts was the creation of what we now call money. All right, so in the interest of time, I'm going to boil it down really quickly for you. The, uh, imagine, so I'm going to make an exaggerated scenario, but just to get the idea, the logic of the argument. So Menger's saying, imagine we have a state of barter. There's no money. We just trade things directly against each other, useful commodities. He said, even in that situation, some would be more marketable than others. There would be certain commodities that lots of people would use, like you know, sugar and flour and bread and, and eggs, where there'd be other commodities that would not have a very big market on any given day. So imagine somebody uh, who, who makes like telescopes, like really fancy, intricate telescopes. That's his business, okay, and then he wants to go sell that, and he needs to get eggs and and milk and, and all sorts of sweaters and all sorts of things for his household in a state of barter you know he would have to go out and, and find one other person who had that whole array of goods that he was looking for that he wanted to go to market to obtain and that person was looking for the exact kind of telescope that he was bringing to market that day okay so you could see the, the odds of that happening of those two sorts of people meeting up are vanishingly small and that's what economists call the problem, the double coincidence of wants, that in, under barter, you need to, if you have something you want to sell and you have it in something you want to buy, you have to find someone with the reverse valuations or else it, the trade won't go through. So Menger said clearly what an obvious solution to that is, or a, a stepping stone, is the person going to market with the telescope, even if he can't find someone who has exactly the array of goods that he's looking for, that that's his, his point in going to market that day, let's say he finds someone who wants the telescope and that person's willing to give him 
a good that's far more marketable than the telescope is. Because the telescope, even though it's valuable, it's, not, it's very illiquid, to use more modern terminology. So Menger would have said it's unsaleable, that it's hard to sell. Okay? It doesn't mean it's got low value. right? There's, there's a distinction there. Just like a house is very valuable, but a house is very illiquid. Okay? Whereas a $10 bill is not nearly as valuable as a house, but it's very liquid. Okay? So there, that's a distinction. Same thing, the telescope could be really valuable, but very illiquid or unmarketable. So an obvious solution is if he finds just somebody who's willing to buy the telescope and give him stuff that's in the proper range of value in terms of market exchange, but yet is more liquid than the telescope, then he'll go ahead and do that. All right? So let's say he finds someone who has a bunch of flour and is willing to give him you know, lots of sacks of flour for the telescope. So he would do that, not because he wants to have go home with that many sacks of flour, but because he realizes I can use the flour then and then trade and get the stuff that I ultimately want. Okay, because there's more people out there on any given day who want flour than who want a telescope like this. Okay, so that's the logic of the argument. And then once, once you get over that little hump, then the rest is obvious that from the initial state of where some goods were more marketable just because more people wanted to use them directly, that would, it would be a snowball effect. So now this guy going to market who maybe not, didn't want flour at all, he would be willing to accept it in trade knowing, well, I can unload this more easily than that telescope. Okay, so now there's one more person in the community who's willing to accept flour. Okay, so things that had an initial advantage in marketability, it gets multiplied. And so the, the term for that is a medium of exchange. So a medium of exchange by itself isn't money, it just means something that you're willing to accept, not because you want it directly, but because you plan on trading in a way to get something else. Okay, so then where does money come from? Well, Menger just said, well, this process would snowball over time and things that were initially a little bit more marketable, more people would accept because of that fact, it would multiply. And then eventually, if you got to a point where there were one or a few commodities that everybody in the community would accept as a medium of exchange, that's what money is. Okay, and then the, so, so being money is just an empirical, it's a question of degree. Whereas a medium of exchange, that's like a qualitative difference. Okay, if you accept something not because you want to use it yourself, but because you plan on trading away, that's what makes it a medium of exchange. But if it's money, it just means, is this thing a medium of exchange for enough people in the relevantly defined community that it's, it's you know, universally acceptable? Then that's what makes it money. So all money is a medium of exchange, but not all media of exchange are money. Okay. Then to explain why historically were some things monies and others not, there were a few principles that would make for a good money. So if something was durable, uh, easily divisible, uh, homogeneous uh, in, in terms of smaller divisible parts, things like that would uh, a convenient market exchange value for its weight, things like that would make for a good money. And so that's why like cattle aren't very good actually because they're hard to maintain, they're hard to move around, they go to the bathroom, that sort of thing. Right? So even though cattle in certain places was money, that's not why in 1850 the merchants around the world were using cattle as money because that's inefficient. The reason gold and silver were the monies par excellence is because they were good on all of those dimensions. So let me just quickly walk through. Um, so you might wonder, well, how come diamonds didn't become money, even though in many respects diamonds are kind of like gold? Well, because diamond, uh, it's not that a pound of diamonds is the same as a pound of diamonds. Right? If you have one huge diamond that's a pound, that's more valuable than a bunch of tiny little diamonds that collectively weigh a pound. Whereas with gold, that's not true. If you have a pound of gold and a pound of gold, unless it happens to be like in an antique coin or something, you could just melt it down and then you know, you do whatever you want with it. So a, a pound of gold or silver is a pound of gold or silver, again, except for numismatic value. Whereas that's not true for diamonds or, or emeralds and things like that. Um, you might say, okay, well, how come... You know, bronze or uh, platinum didn't become money. How come gold and silver were well, just because the vagaries of exchange and convenience, gold and silver were good that for big purchases, gold coins were convenient, and for smaller purchases, silver coins were convenient in terms of how much weight of metal in your pocket, whereas bronze, you would have needed to be carrying around too much weight for the transactions you wanted to do. And for metals that were rarer than gold, it was the opposite problem, that it was too small that you know, you'd have to dilute it too much for a given coin, otherwise you know, you'd, only, you'd only use it very rarely. Okay, so that's Menger's story for how money would have emerged spontaneously from a state of barter. Okay, and so notice 
in that, in that explanation, nobody ever sat around saying we really have to work hard to create money because that will help everybody. It just spontaneously happened. So you can see why libertarians like that kind of a story, right? That it didn't take any central planner. It just spontaneously happened. Everyone working in his own interest. And also why, you know, objectivists would like that kind of story. Okay, the other contribution that Menger gave was what's called marginal subjective value theory. And that overturned the classical economist approach that relied on the cost theory. Now, we're running low on time here, and so I want to get to the, the meat of this and the, the Bitcoin issue. So really quickly, the classical economists tended to explain relative prices in the market by the cost of production. And so, just loosely speaking, if you said, how come a bottle of champagne caught, has such a high price, they would say, well, you know, the, the, the land on which the, the grapes are grown and so forth is really expensive, and so it costs a lot to make that thing, so they have to be able to charge enough to cover their costs. With Menger's approach, it flipped it on its head and said, no, the reason a bottle of champagne is, has a high market value is people like to drink it. It gives them utility, and you know, one more bottle of champagne gives them a lot of happiness, and that's why it has a high market price. And because of that, the people who grow the, the grapes that are needed to make that stuff are willing to pay a lot for that particular land. And so they can bid away that land from potential other uses. And so it's the other way around, that it's the high price of the champagne that makes the cost of production end up being higher. All right? But ultimately, it's subjective consumer valuations of the object that is the source of its value in the marketplace. So it's not anything objective it's not a feature out there, it's in the human mind. All right, so that's subjective value theory, and that is the modern explanation of market prices. So that's not just an Austrian thing, it's just Menger happened to be one of the pioneers in that, who's also happened to be an Austrian economist. Okay, but ironically perhaps, even though that swept the field, economists use that approach to explain relative prices, like why a horse would trade for so many barrels of marmalade or something like that in terms of relative values, but to explain the purchasing power of money, they didn't use subjective value theory because they thought they would be arguing in a circle. So let me just try to get you to see this, and then you'll understand what, what Mises solved. And then, and then we'll be finally where we need to be so you understand where Bitcoin comes in. All right? So um, I get my students to pay attention because they know I'm going to quiz them, but you guys just bear with me here. All right. Okay, so... The, the problem, so like I said, economists across the board embraced what was called subjective value theory. They realized the old classical approach of a cost theory of value was wrong. There was lots of problems with that. The subjective value theory could explain everything. It was great. But they thought the one area where it didn't really make sense or it seemed kind of superfluous was explaining the purchasing power of money. So let me just boil it down for you. If I say, why is it that this teenager is willing to sell an hour of his labor for a $10 bill? The subjective value theory would say, oh, because he subjectively values getting that $10 bill more than his hour of leisure. And you say, okay, but why does he value that $10 bill? It's just a green piece of paper. You know, he can't eat it. It's not very useful for much. You say, oh, well, because he can go buy stuff with it. That's why he values it. So it looks like you're just arguing in a circle. It looks like you're saying the reason a $10 bill can buy things like an hour of labor is that a $10 bill can buy things. And so, you know, I could just as well, that explanation could just as well explain why he would sell his labor for a $1,000 bill if, if the stuff he wanted to buy, you know, in the market was roughly comparable to his hour of labor, right? So it, it, the subjective value theory seemed like it explained relative prices, like why an hour of labor would trade for so many cans of Coke, but it didn't seem like it would explain the actual absolute value of dollars, let's say, all right? So Mises was the one who explained that element of the problem. And he said, no, it's, you got to bring the time element into it, that really what's going on when you sell an hour of labor or anything in general right now for money, it's because you have an expectation of the future purchasing power of money, right? You're expecting money now because you think when you spend it down the road, it will be able to buy some stuff. So you're explaining the current purchasing power of money by reference to expectations of its future ones. So there's a little bit of a time element involved. And so then, if you, so then the, the economist said, well, wait a minute, Mises, though, okay, you're right, it's not a circular argument, but now it's just an infinite regress. You're basically saying the reason money has purchasing power today is that people yesterday thought it was going to have purchasing power, or they, they had some expectations of what it was going to be yesterday. 
All right. And so it's, you know, where, where do we get these, where do we get our expectations of what the $10 bill is going to buy the, the teenager? It's because he has recently been to the store and saw it with his own eyes, what a $10 bill buys. Okay. So Mises kind of split it up and said, loosely speaking, yesterday, the teenager saw what a $10 bill could buy. So today he sells an hour of labor for a $10 bill because he expects tomorrow he has a good idea of what a $10 bill can buy. So it, it's like tomorrow's purchasing power ultimately gets explained by yesterday's purchasing power. So the economist said, well, Mises, you're just arguing an infinite regress. How do you explain yesterday's purchasing power? Well, you'd have to go to the day before. And then they, they threw their hands up. And then Mises said, no, 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 it's, it wouldn't go back infinitely. So it's true. My story says ultimately today's purchasing power is based on yesterday's. Yesterday's is ultimately based on the day before and so on. But it's not infinite. There's a definite stopping point when we get back to the original state of barter. Because Menger has already shown us how you go from barter to the emergence of money. And so Mises is saying what I'm telling you is right now using subjective value theory, I can explain the purchasing power of money by reference to our knowledge of yesterday's prices. And we could go back step by step ultimately to barter because Menger's shown us how to get out of that trap. And once we're in barter, we, you know, we don't have this issue of a circular argument. It's we already know, we all agree as economists how to explain barter prices because that's just relative prices. Okay, so that is the, the you know that's the way I would have taught this stuff to my students back when I was a college professor. That's the way we, you know writing up study guides for Austrian economics. That's what I would give. All right. So now I, I hope you guys can see at least the the issue of where Bitcoin comes in. It it, it looks like it's that shouldn't be possible, and you'll see many people literally say, "Well, no, Mises showed that uh, in order for something to be a money, it must have first served." As, an, as a commodity. Oh, by the way, in case you're concerned, one of the, um, you know, you say, well, what about the fiat money, government fiat money, like dollars and, and, and euros and stuff? That's not, was never used as a commodity. So how did Mises explain that? Well, he, he would say that was, orig historically, those were redeemable in gold and silver. So it's not that some group of people just started using unbacked U.S. dollars, it's historically was tied to gold and that link was severed. So that's how people had the connection. So it's, it's not a, a, a moralistic or a, a fairness argument. It's an argument about people need to know what the purchasing power is in order to even for it to get off the ground. That's kind of where the argument is. So a lot of people say, well, Bitcoin can never become money because of this issue. So we're getting close here. We want to switch to Q&A. So let me just offer the, some of the things I've said in this debate on this topic, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys and, and maybe Q&A will we'll get further along. So uh, one thing I pointed out to people is I said, you've got to be really careful. You're going to end up making Mises look like an idiot because if you say, uh, like I said, I'm not putting words in people's mouth. People literally will say it. I'm sure many of you have seen this on the internet that uh, it, it, Bitcoin can never become money. Yeah, sure, right now, a small group of people use it, but it will never be a widely accepted money because of the Mises regression theorem. And I, and I was pointing out, that's not a good argument. You, you're misunderstanding it. If Mises is right and has something relevant to say against Bitcoin, it can't be a medium of exchange. Because the you know, whether something's a medium of exchange turned into money, that's just an empirical qu quantitative matter of how many people are using it. The decisive thing is someone willing to accept it to then go buy something else with it. And in Mises' actual words, and the Theory of Money and Credit, the book where he developed this, he says stuff like, it is unthinkable that something could serve as a medium of exchange without having previously been in use as a regular commodity that was not valued for, for those reasons. Okay, so it's, it's Mises himself who puts the, the crux of the matter on whether it can be a medium of exchange, whether it's a money is just a, a, a detail after that point. So I'm pointing out to people, Bitcoin, and, and I, I was actually at a conference one time in and a guy who was of this mindset said something like, he made a real sweeping statement like, well, no, right now, nobody, people just use Bitcoin to get other currencies. No one actually buys real goods and services with Bitcoin. You know, and some 18-year-old in the crowd said, well, I do. And, and, he, and he, he was good about it. He was cool about it. He just went, oh. And then we just moved on. Like, it's the economist admits he was wrong, you know, page one. But, so that, so that was good. But, so that's, that's part of it. So, uh, so that's the lie. So I, I, you know, trying to walk people through and say, just be really careful if you want to hold up Mises as this guru on this matter. That the way you guys are framing it, he already is demonstrably wrong. So I think you want to, you know, recalibrate the argument. 
So it, it wouldn't be an issue of could it ever evolve into money. So clearly we see that Bitcoin is already out there serving as a medium of exchange. And again, in case you're losing the terminology, just meaning people will sell valuable stuff like bicycles and software and T-shirts in exchange for Bitcoin, knowing full well that they're going to use that Bitcoin to acquire other things later. Okay, And so it already is serving as a medium of exchange, so there's clearly no issue about, it, you know, it can't be impossible. If you're thinking Mises proved it was impossible, then Mises was wrong, because it already happened. Uh, so then, the, you know, the other issue for trying to, what I've done in trying to talk with people, you know, people coming from this mindset is to try to understand, okay, is it that, you know, Mises was wrong, that he just overlooked something, or is there some way we can reconcile it? So if you want to try to reconcile it, you could, you could do it like this, and I've seen some people try to say it, people who are fans of Bitcoin and fans of Ludwig von Mises and his regression theorem, and they say, well, no, it, it, it was serving as a, as a useful commodity valued beyond its just ability to serve as a medium of exchange because the early adopters knew that if this thing takes off, you know, it will challenge the state's hegemony or something like that. And so they were valuing it. You know, there's a little, a little kick in there. So that was partly why they were accepting it is because they saw the future. And so it, they weren't just valuing it as a, as a medium of exchange, right? So that's, that's one way to try to work it in. You know, just like gold and silver were valued as jewelry before people started accepting them as, as a medium of exchange. By the same token, they're saying people, you know, would have just intr intrinsically valued Bitcoin for ideological reasons. Okay, so that's one sort of escape hatch. Uh, my, my leaning, and this is the, the last point I'll make here and turn over to your guys' questions, I think it's, we, we should just admit that he, Mises didn't conceive of this possibility. Because in practice, I, again, not to throw him under the bus, and you can see where he's coming from, it, it is odd. Remember the problem with, with the shells and, and Menger's critique of the idea that some king just woke up one day and invented money out of thin air Again, one of the arguments against that was to say, well, how would anybody know how much purchasing power it should have? That's kind of weird. But actually what happened historically with Bitcoin is in the beginning it had virtually zero purchasing power, but it wasn't exactly zero. And so I don't think anyone ever conceived of that, that you might get people to adopt something not having any experience with what its purchasing power was if it was so cheap that in the grand scheme of things, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take that and you know, I'll, I'll take a thousand of these for a pizza or whatever because... You know, it's not a big deal to give up one pizza for this stuff. And then if that was just the genesis to then give us some framework for how do we know what it's purchasing power, then it, it's off to the races. So in my mind, you, you could bend over backwards and try to say, well, no, that fits into what Mises said. I, I think it's just easier to say he didn't conceive of that possibility, that it could start out with a really low purchasing power that then mushroomed over time. Uh, actually, I, I lied. One more thing I want to, do, want to say, into, again, in terms of you guys understanding the, the hesitance or the resistance Again, part of the appeal of the Mangarian story was nobody had to invent money. It wasn't that they sat around scratching their heads and agonizing over it. There weren't conferences to get people to start using gold as money. It just happened spontaneously. And so a lot of Austro-Libertarians think it's, it's weird. When they, and they read stuff like, you know, after the Mount Gox goes down, and, and I saw some people writing, you know, real heartfelt Reactions and saying things like, okay, guys, you know, this isn't the end. We just got to regroup and, and let's not give up. This is, a, you know, this thing will work. We just got to think it through. And so a lot of libertarians look at there and say, that's, it shouldn't be this hard. You know, you shouldn't have to plan this. And it just strikes them as, as icky, like, oh, we're central planners. Okay, so I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just, I just want you to understand the emotional, why that seems odd to them. And so for a lot of people, they, they don't understand this. Okay, so I'll stop there and turn over to questions.